Three Friends, one amazing series of YA novels. An insatiable thirst to relive the glory that is K.A. Applegate's literary masterpiece. This is Phantomorphs, the Dork Bajir Chronicles. Hello and welcome to the Dork Bajir Chronicles, a podcast where we read through the Animorph series one book at a time, then talk about it every week. Today we'll be talking about Animorphs number 35, The Proposal. My name is Mikhail, the host. I'm Tessa, the expert. And I'm Braden, a weird jar of oatmeal in my house that's in front of me. That was great, but for maybe take two, which one of Marco turning into a poodle morphs are you feeling right now? Okay, okay. Um, yes, and I'm Braden. And I am, I'm actually the last one. I'm feeling pretty poodly right now. I think of number two, where you got like a little bit of a wet nose and your arms have gotten skinny (laughs) and you're baring your teeth uncomfortably. I'm number three, where it's like literally a Jim Henson puppet. (laughs) 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 Uh, Okay, well, let's start off with some Phantom Mail. Phantom Mail! Ooh, yeah! Uh, Dylan, at Dill Stoney on Twitter, uh, tweeted to us, had to write a haiku for English. I was inspired by only the best. And, uh, I'd just like to do a dramatic reading. <clears throat> away. Fly away. Sweet bird of prey, you need to fly away. Away. Update. Having read it in front of the class was less funny than what I thought in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you gotta, like... Snaps for the pr- snaps for the poem, right? That's what you do. Our next piece of fan mail comes from oh, this is from Shanna, um, patron Shanna, who says, uh, "Is this oh on a commenting on a post where we were posting about the bloopers we have for our patrons? Is this why I never hear Braden talking much anymore? Is all his dialogue just in the bloopers? Oh, uh, that's as the editor. Um, yes, in fact, a large portion of the bloopers are rants." and or songs sort of fascist creed that i have to cut out i have been trying to speak up a bit more on topic lately i sort of <laughs> for a while i um it, it, i i i found myself slipping into just like trying to find that beat trying to find that joke that jokey joke to tell in there but um i i th- i realize now that there is less usable material from me when I do that, I assure you, uh, Twitterverse and Facebookverse, that will be rectified. Oh, well, that's very sweet of you. That's a good idea. Uh, okay, let's jump into the summary, which is my turn to do uh, Serendipitous, oh, edit, oh. as it is a Marco book. Oh, 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 oh. On topic howls as well. Uh, so for this one, the there's no real goof. Uh, other than like Marco and his dad playing video games, but that ties in to the B plot pretty carefully. The B plot is Marco like can't morph properly because he's stressed out about his dad dating a woman again. And uh, so this, I wasn't totally clear, but I went back and read it. It's been two years since his mom died. So his dad has been single for two years. So anyways, Marco has panic attacks when he's morphing. We'll get to that in the, in the A plot. Um, in the A-plot, though, they have to figure out how to stop a TV personality that Marco sees recommending people to go to the sharing. He's like this hippy-dippy guy named William Roger Tennant. What's the name of his show? Critical cr- Contact? What is Contact it? Contact Point. Point. It's something really dumb that sounds like it should be about surfers and murder <laughs> mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. I, it didn't fit at all. It should have been like It didn't. And also can you hour. Imagine watching this talk show. It's a guy wearing a kind of dressy button down jeans. He's got a beard. He's got long brown hair pulled back into a ponytail. He's sitting cross-legged on an overstuffed comfy chair and that's it. No one else is around him. He's just surrounded by 6-foot tall lava lamps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really this is hammered home the lava lamp point. Like, I want a six foot tall lava lamp in my house. Is this now. just like 
Like, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Zach Galifianakis's Between Two Ferns. <laughs> but just like, they're a bunch of dumb teenagers who take it seriously. A bunch of fucking lava lamps. And like, everybody who's calling in is already a yerk. And they're just looking for their own help. <laughs> Zach Galifianakis is not ordered like is not um, given prime time TV spots though. I think the internet is pretty much the only place that a show like Between Two Ferns could. Well, be. he's given prime time if you're like a high college kid. Okay, that's a I good mean, point. But also, Zach Galifianakis has the energy of a man who would definitely throttle a poodle, whereas we know William Roger Tennant would never do something like that. Or Never. would he read Ooh. on? Ooh. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> Anyways, um, so Marco's like, okay, that's obviously fucked up that a f- clearly like semi-locally famous guy is telling people to go to a yerk front. This guy is clearly a yerk, goes to the garage to do his bird morph to go tell the others. Or no, he calls Jake, calls a meeting. Then he's going to fly to the barn. But then that's where we get the first instance of him fucking up where he goes. There's a lot of good visuals of half animals in this one. Yeah. He goes, he's half osprey, half lobster. Yeah. He's got the the lobster face and claws, but then an osprey body and tail. And the like antennae of a lobster, which is also fucked up. Anyways. um, I didn't like, I didn't like picturing it. I I actually, I, guys, I didn't finish the book. I didn't want to read more. I couldn't handle it. You couldn't get past this part? Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. It made me queasy. I needed a gingy ale. (laughs) Uh, Sidebar, ginger ale does not do anything for you when you're sick. Drink seltzer water. That's what's actually helping you. Or like just actually eat ginger, you animal. That's more preventative. It doesn't do really a whole lot for you when you're already sick. But anyways. No, it helps. It's supposed to settle your stomach if you're queasy. That's the idea. If you're nauseous, it helps settle the, the nausea. Sounds mm-hmm. like hokum. Sounds like William Roger Tennant told you to say <gasps> How did you know? I take all oh, of my cues dang. from William Roger Tennant. Oh, no, he wouldn't because maple ginger. Anyways, <laughs> getting off topic. So they uh, meet at the barn. They decide that the way to figure out how to get to this guy is to sneak into his house and morph cockatiels. Which I had to look up. So cockatiels are like this. I, I was thinking cockatoos, which are like the big white. No, that's what I was thinking. Okay, what the fuck's a cockatiel then? Do you know how big a lovebird is? They're like just itty bitty. Oh. Yeah. A cockatiel is like, it looks like a cockatoo, but more colorful and a little tiny bit bigger than a lovebird. Yeah. And it's got the yeah. little crest. I think I was getting them mixed up because a cockatoo and a cockatiel both have the feathers that go up on their face. That's exactly why I thought that. Also, my aunt has a cockatoo, and that's just for some reason I was picturing that. Anyways. Wow. Um, Because this this guy, William Roger Tennant, has a shitload of birds in his house because he's like a hippy-dippy bird lover, animal lover. And it also has a bird load of shit in his house because he's got a lot of birds, and he lets them fly Mm. around like crazy. And he he constantly narrates his phone calls to them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Just like, yes, sir. I am doing that Candrona shit. Why, yeah, yes, yeah. sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. No, You're sir. Ahead. You're jumping yes, ahead. Sir. Okay, fair, s- fair, fair. Okay, okay. So they, they sneak in as squirrels. So they go in as like just regular ass squirrels to the outside of his house. Jake brings a fucking pocket knife with him and yep. cuts through the screen, which is amazing. Just the, the thought or the, the visual of a squirrel like hacking through this screen window. Fuck yeah. Uh, anyways, when they're inside, they split up. Uh, Rachel and Marco are paired up. Unlikely pair up? I'm not sure why they did that. Yeah, this was this was an interesting duo. I you thought. You know, in like uh, comedies where, like TV comedies, where they have, let's say, four or five people in the main cast, and then almost every episode, it's like they split up into groups. And there's always like, like in Seinfeld, for example, like. George and George and Jerry were like always together at the beginning, but then they started pairing off in weird ways where like you'd have a George and Elaine plot line and it never really felt the same. That's kind of how I felt. It's like Phoebe and Ross in Friends. Yeah. They try to get them to go together and you're like, oh, I mean, I guess they're just they w- it's because they wouldn't be friends in real life. Right. Like they wouldn't. <laughs> They wouldn't. Phoebe no, mugged would they? Ross. Like, they would not be friends in real life. <laughs> they, anyways, 
<laughs> Anyways, uh, okay. So they split up on their inside. Um, Rachel and Marco, since we're in Marco's point of view, we don't get a whole lot of info for the other teams. Tobias no. is outside. That's important. Um, Which I thought was interesting. Did they just make Tobias stay outside to do surveillance because he's the best at it? Or did he not want to morph an inferior bird? That's a good point, actually. Oh. I'm pretty sure it was just a surveillance one, but yeah. <laughs> um, so they observe Tennant at his computer, and he is, according to Rachel, doing a mail merge, which I feel like my 90s kids' shoes were taken away from me, because I feel like I should know what that is, but I don't have any idea what that means. Are you just, like, adding mail from two different mailboxes, like, two <laughs> different email accounts into one? Because that's what it sounds like, but also, why would you do that? Well, like, I think they were talking about real letters. Oh. No, he's typing a real letter as a thank you for giving me a primetime TV spot. Wait, typing a real- I, I think we're coming at this from different angles. I'm saying real letter as in, like, writing one, like, on- on paper. Oh. oh no, I think I think he was typing on like a Word document a letter of like thanks so much that he was then going to print out and mail once he got the prime time TV spot. Anyways, the, the the key point of this is that he's <laughs> writing something to the head of a big network or his network saying like thank you for giving me this award and the prime time spot. So I think this is where they first learn that he's like going to be on prime time. Uh, anyways, while they're still in the room, Rachel lands on his head. Also. Yeah, just like flies over to his head. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I've seen people do this before. I've seen oh, what the fuck? Do this. You sat on my face. The uh, guy does not notice, uh, which makes sense if you live with birds, I guess. Um, so while he's doing this email thing, he gets a phone call from Vista 3 uh, and tells him that I think I think the actual wording was like the Condrona is almost done being built or something like that. It's something about a Condrona construction project. It's like, yeah, it's it's almost here, as you know. And then he like, yeah, he narrates, as you know, Visser, here's some exposition about my <laughs> evil plans and our evil plans together. Good thing there's no Andalites here to listen in on what we're yeah. plotting. Like, it's like, what? <laughs> yes, sir. No, sir. I'll let my birds know, sir. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so Marco is sitting on a perch nearby and he... Has another panic attack and he poops on Tenant's desk and Tenant is like, oh boy, I'm pissed at this bird. And he starts to like, cr <laughs> actually it's pretty like horrifying because he starts to cr like, he grabs Marco and starts crushing his ribs with his two thumbs, like pushing his ribs into his body, obviously about to kill him. But then um, Tenant, the real Tenant fights, like fights the yerk so the host body fights the yerk and basically the yerk rationalizes his inability to control tenant by saying like oh i'll kill you all later and i can't wait to do it <laughs> i mean i'm not condoning animal cruelty here let's put that up front and <laughs> it sounds extra bad that i had to put that up front yeah, but like marco didn't just poop on his desk marco had another panic attack and was like ripping out some of his own feathers and oh, like yeah. started screaming and just, oh, like, true. rocking back and forth. And then he pooped on, on while, like, Tenant is trying to get him to be calm and be like, sorry, Visser, my birds are just going batshit. <laughs> As someone with, like, yappy dogs who, that, I can understand that feeling. I, I don't it. condone animal violence like no. Tessa does. But I, I mean, my cat <laughs> screams at six in the morning. So, like, I don't condone violence against animals. But, like... On the one hand, you kind of get get it, right? <laughs> I get the feeling. Listen, there's nothing unhealthy about, like, wanting to hurt someone. There's probably something unhealthy about actually doing that. You have to, you know, you, you feel the impulse and you don't act on it, right? Aw. Yeah. Was that for me? That's for all the Bradens out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So there's, like, a fucked up fight in the... Uh... I, I just like to point out real quick that I did make a note here. That, like, this is kind of the first time I realized how much Yerks love just venting their rage and their opinions. Yeah. <laughs> like, this must be a very mentally healthy race. I just, mean, like, yes. constantly in therapy. But what about the uh, victims of that who get murdered when they're angry? I mean... <laughs> I'm not okay with animal violence, but it is therapeutic, let me tell you. Um, anyways, <laughs> no! so, uh, because obviously this is escalating like crazy and Rachel is like almost having to 
attack this guy, which would just put her into a vulnerable position. Uh, she, oh, she does a sweep. So, so the others in the house, this is kind of where it got a bit like confusing for me, I guess, as to what's actually happening. Cause it's all happening in like other rooms that Marco's not a part of, but he's hearing the thoughts <laughs> speak of. So there's a fight going on. There are hork there. Uh, Rachel then grabs the guy's toupee, which is funny to think about. Like, I don't know if you can have a toupee that's a huge ponytail. I, mean, I guess you could. Like, why couldn't you? I mean, it's just a wig at that point. I don't know if a toupee to me feels like a shorter. This is just a wig. Yeah. A toupee has to have, like, um, what, what's the word I'm thinking? A toupee has, can't be, at least in my mind, it can't be too, like, weighted to one side or the other, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But, like, I mean, if it works, it works, I guess. I think you're right. And also, a toupee is just like a wig you put on yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really, if you think about it. Anyways, um, Marco tries Wait, to what's ha- a wig you don't put on yourself? Like for movies. A wig you put on someone else. Oh, okay. <gasps> yeah. By that, Mikhail means a merkin, obviously. Because I would say a wig, a, like if you call it a wig... Either you're a very costumey type of person, which is rare, yeah. or you're like actually in a production that requires some kind of theatrical wig, right? Whereas a toupee is like, nah, I'm just a bald guy that doesn't like looking bald. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. I mean, no shame for people who wear toupees. They're pretty nice these days. But anyways, um, so he hides under a desk. He tries to morph a gorilla and turns into a gorilla with giant... Or sorry, he turns into a fish with gorilla arms, which is pretty great yeah like can you imagine just that thing walking on his big gorilla hands and then it's just a little trout body flapping like it looks like some crazy (laughs) creature that would be in a munchkin game or something (laughs) i i just imagine that he can like he's just literally a fish with giant arms so the only way he can walk around is like on his hands but he like points at people a lot <laughs> for some reason anyways <laughs> they uh they there's a big kerfuffle it's a pretty good scene but there's not much detail that's worth repeating uh they escape with marco as his normal self so he actually gets away without being seen in his human body and hides and it's implied that they get away uh obviously rachel saw all this crazy shit happen to him which nobody knew about yet with the half morphing so they confront him at the barn after the mission well, and also there's the worry that some of the hork or William Roger Tennant saw Marco as a human in the kerfuffle. Totally. And the worry that in, in future missions that could happen, right? Yeah. So uh, they are like, all right, let's just chill for tonight uh, and figure out what we're going to do later. Uh, Marco gets home. This is B-plot stuff. Marco Woo! gets home. The lights are <laughs> off. Unknown car in the driveway. <laughs> Mrs. Know. Math teacher on the couch sucking face with Marco's dad. <laughs> it oh, describes God. Marco's dad's face is as red as the lipstick smeared on it. Oh! oh gross. That literal line. And also, so I don't know jack shit about Mrs. Robinette. Right, the math teacher, she seems fine. She seems nice. She's kissing this Wait, old sad Wait, Robinette? Man. Oh my god, I didn't say it out loud. Mrs. Robinette out? Oh! <laughs> gig, 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 gig. Um, so Marco's obviously not super happy about this, uh, especially when the poodle attacks him, like, viciously. So then he just goes and plays video games. Um, although it does say that like, the dog is chewing on Marco's cuff of his jeans up until he reaches the door of his room, where he gently pries the dog off and goes into his room. I was like, good for you. That was an edit. Though. I feel like that was an <laughs> Probably. edit. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Like, I feel like they had to, like, y- you know, this is his lowest moment. This is where we should be seeing Marco, like, giving in to his darker urges as, like, a metaphor for giving in to, like, the multiple bestial sides of him, but then they realize, like, we can't have our hero character kicking a dog in a 90s <laughs> YA novel. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, they think it over, and they decide, uh, the, I'm talking about the Anwars here, they decide that the way to get Tenet exposed is to have a bunch of people see him being a dick to animals. Or embarrass him or make him freak out in a way that would totally betray his, like, hippy-dippy free love persona in public yeah. so 
I have my qualms with this. I think we'll get into this a bit more next week when we talk about our alternate plan. But they decide that the way to do this is to um, morph cockroaches and hide in tenant salad during a banquet where a lot of people will be there, including TV people. Um, there's a bit of a time crunch on this now, especially that they know that he's going to be on primetime. So now it's not like, let's just do whatever, whenever. They have to actually... Hurry up we gotta on get this shit done. On the wildly popular UPN. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. But I looked up UPN because I could not fucking remember what the hell it was. They picked such a bad network in terms of a lasting reference that will make sense to people in the future. But anyways, um, so Marco's job is to not morph because they're like, listen, you're fucking up your morphs. We can't have you morphing. So they sneak in, Marco demorphs and pretends to be a busboy uh, and confronts the salad chef. Is the salad chef French? I can't remember. There's a French chef that's quite funny. The salad chef isn't French, but he calls mm-hmm. himself like the garde monsieur or whatever, which is <laughs> yeah. the fancy term for salad chef. It's like sous chef. Like yeah. the guy who's a sous chef isn't necessarily French, but he's going to yeah. call himself a sous chef. And he's got an accent salad. and his name is Marcel. <laughs> and they really let him fucking have it, this book. Like, no love for the French. Yeah. Also, as someone who's worked in multiple kitchens, uh, the salad person is like the salad slave. Like, there's no artistry in the salad making in the <laughs> kitchen. No, like yeah, this. this salad guy was, like, way up on his high horse. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I've seen Ratatouille. I know where on the totem pole like, you are. Come yeah. on. Also, in a catering business, like there's really one chef. Everyone I else is an employee. Of adding a meat to my salad? <laughs> that is too much work for us. <laughs> I will kill you. Uh, um, anyways, uh, so he tries to set it up that tenant salad will have no tomatoes, yeah. and therefore they'll know which salad to to hide in as roaches. This goes bad and like obviously i'm sure more than one person also would order a salad with no tomatoes but either way salad guys like whatever and then the waiters are like no no it's more like this salad has no tomatoes on it because tenant doesn't like tomatoes and then they put the roaches mm-hmm. on it and it's it's not like oh you know people order a salad with no tomatoes it's more like this is the special salad for william roger tenant sure but my point still stands of like multiple people could order a salad with no tomato. Tons of people don't like tomatoes. It's a bad thing to delineate. Well, and also, as we know, like the guy just didn't even fucking care. And he was like, if Tenet doesn't like tomatoes, he can take them off. Also, I think he made it and they just gave it to someone else. Like, anyways. Um, Zach because something. Because it, it still went out. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Fucking whatever. This is tiny. Ah, s- said Rachel. Small, ah, small said details. Zach. Ah! ah, said a lady in a red dress. Right. Zach Hansen from Hansen the Band was there, which is maybe <laughs> our first like celebrity appearance of a real thing from real life in Animorphs. No, Arnold. Bruce Willis, Arnold. But like I guess they never I don't think they ever really got within ten feet of them. No, exactly. This is the first like almost could have touched them. Is Zach Hansen one? Is he is he uh is he somebody who's now an uncomfortable reference? I feel like I feel like I've heard him in the context of like a a, a hashtag got groped. Uh, sullied. I hate. Anyways, fucking everyone sucks. Get over it. Oh, but no, also if no. he did something super bad, then I I'll take that back. No, no, he's good. He's good. He okay. also maybe looks a little young to have been the person. We're probably thinking of the wrong one. Anyway. Anyways, um, it goes badly because the salad does not go to Tenant. It goes to Zach Hansen. So things are all fucked up. Uh, this is not even including the part where Marco yes. fucks up his yes. morph because he was supposed to morph a spider and get into the salad Ooh. afterwards. Doesn't. He morphs a half spider, half skunk, which the kitchen staff then chases Potentially him. Potentially a spunk. <laughs> a spunk, yeah. Uh, he scares a bunch of non-yurks, hopefully, by thought speaking to them, and then uh, Demorphs pretends to be a busboy again, but then he's forced to clean the f- garbage food bin with a shovel. The pig bucket. Pig bucket. Okay, this pig is not a real thing. Bucket. I I've asked someone who worked in. I mean, yeah, he didn't work in a fancy hotel kitchen, but he's worked in kitchens before, and I was like, yeah, is that 
the bucket that's full of like half eaten food. Do you call it the pig bucket? He's like, no. <laughs> so that sounds like a farming term. It like. sounds like a fake thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so Zach Hansen gets this thing with the cockroaches in it. Obviously, freaks out. Tenant does not get it. So uh, everything calms down sl- slightly enough for Axe to more for human and pretend to be a busboy like Marco. Oh, he man. then carries the fleas on his body to tenant and then of course two books in a fucking row oh no wait last book he didn't it, two books ago he morphed a human around foods and it caused a bunch of fuckery <laughs> but uh causes a giant scene by quote-unquote clearing people's plates like other bus boys which is actually just eating food off of them and grabbing the plates Ugh, fucking kill this kid like god damn it He's just like licking the Thousand Islands dressing off these people's plates and nobody has kicked yeah. him out of this extremely fancy dinner in this extremely fancy hotel. Well, they, they're they the on fuck? their way because I'm pretty sure a lot of people like swarm them and like, what the fuck? And like, but before that happens, they get the fleas onto Tenant and they start biting the shit out of his skull, which Marco isn't there, but he's hearing all the thought speak. Which is funny, but as he's shoveling this fucking pig bucket, he's hearing all this thought speak happening. They suck blood out of Tenant's head, hoping to get him to, like, presumably throw the toupee off and start scratching like crazy. Not a great plan. Was a plan B, mind you, but still. Uh, also, uh, let's talk about it next week. Anyways, uh, <laughs> they it doesn't work. Basically, it literally doesn't work. They just leave. Uh, then we get a scene where marco's at home again by himself but cassie comes over and like has has like a counseling session with him which i guess she would be the character to do that this marco is this is where we really this is where i wrote down marco is truly the ideal of the male gamer mad online calling people morons on fucking 4chan telling concerned women to fuck off being mad about other people having sex. This is, this is so powerful. <laughs> I mean, he's mad about his dad having sex with someone when he knows his mom is still alive. So that's a, that's a little different, but I get you. It does feel pretty forced. At least that's my opinion on it. I've never felt more represented in media. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Who's your Cassie, Brayden? Uh, my Cassie is uh reading animorphs i feel better when i read animorphs good response (laughs) uh okay so basically (laughs) she tells him like listen you can't look after anybody you can't do shit about shit but you can take care of yourself mentally and marco's like fuck you my only goal in life is to crush noobs and fuck chicks (laughs) <laughs> he doesn't say that, but he does not respond well to getting advice like that. And mind you, I, like, I'm not a therapist, but just telling someone what they need to do is not really, like, great counseling tactics. Anyways. Not really, no. Yeah. Uh, so they decide, and this we get a bit of a montage, if you will, that they still, obviously, they still have to do something about Tenant, despite the banquet not working. So what they do is Marco morphs... Earlier, he had acquired the poodle named Euclid uh, to, to stop it from biting his yeah. stuff or whatever. So he has the poodle morph. So he decides, because they've been surveilling Tenant for a while now, so they yeah, know yeah, his yeah. routine. So what they do is they attack him, sort of quote unquote, attack him in public as this poodle by being annoying and like biting his ankles and all that shit around other people. Like when he's jogging or when he's out in the town. Uh, and obviously, Tenet knows that he can't fuck this poodle up. He also knows that it's an Andalite because he talks to Marco and says, like, Andalite, like, blah, blah, blah. If I get, get you in private, I'll kill you or something like that. Um, so they've got him riled up on this poodle thing. And it all culminates into a TV appearance that Tenet is about to make. Uh, it's an interview with Tenet. And I believe this I think is they where follow the him. will learn. Oh, go ahead. They attack him as this dog, like, over a series of days, don't they? Yeah. Did they? Yep, they terrorize him. They follow him along as he's doing his morning jog and, like, pull his shorts down. Yeah. They, like, <laughs> are there as he's about to go give a speech and rip his sleeve off. And Marco just, oh, like, yeah. tears this huge hole in his pants. 
And then there's another time when he's in front of a bunch of paparazzi about to go talk to some important people and Marcos gets his tie and almost like slams him to the ground. <laughs> Pretty it's good. great. Like I'm just imagining this must have been so therapeutic for Marco. He does say that explicitly, like in the narration. He's like, listen, my life fucking sucks right now. I love this. <laughs> like I <laughs> this love is just, the best. Like needless not needlessly, but like sort of without you know restraint annoying this guy uh, anyways so it culminates into this interview that's going to be televised live uh, or yeah i think live it would have to be live because of what happens it's, it's it's a regular episode of his show which is live but also yeah. there's the guy from upn or whatever who's going to be there to be like oh I'll give you a prime time yeah so it's a it's a it's a critical uh episode let's put it that way so their plan is and it, it works, but it's a little scary. Uh, Axe is going to hack into the network or like the TV studio. And what he's going to do is at a critical moment, he's going to turn on the cameras when Tenant doesn't know they're on and start broadcasting Tenant. Uh, that critical moment is Marco attacking him as the poodle <laughs> on this fucking soundstage. The critical moment is him attacking Marco. Not Marco attacking him. That's Sorry, when you're he right. Snaps and is throttling a poodle like Homer Simpson going after Bart. Why you little? Did they still do that anymore? Not really. Did they phase that out or? I think that's done now. I mean, they're all technically Disney princesses now, so I don't think they're allowed <laughs> to choke their children. Bart especially. Anyways, so uh, it works. Axe hijacks the cameras. Everyone sees it. The production crew is like, what the fuck? Turn this off. Uh, and then they're about to like corner this poodle, who they probably assume is like a rabbit or something. Although they do see Tenet like trying to kill it. But uh, I think it's Cassie and Rachel come out in wolf morph, which was part yeah. of the plan. And they're like, oh, fuck. There's like literal wolves here. Like we need to leave. I think one of the production crew is a yerk, too. Aren't they? They they think because one yeah. of them says Andalite. So one of one someone else on the production crew. Also, the UPN guy says, "You want to put this nutcase on primetime TV? Yeah. I'm not fucking touching him. Send him to Fox." Yeah, ah! <laughs> that's a burn. Also, did we talk about how he turned into a poo bear by accident? Half poodle, half polar bear. Yeah, poodle, poodle bear. That's a good mix too. Actually, I didn't include that. Um, yeah. Then, <laughs> the last, to wrap up the B-plot, because the A-plot is tied up in a neat little bow there, um, Marco's dad gets fucking married in to this woman. Weeks, right? Uh, in two weeks! In, in two, two weeks. weeks! Like, during the book, he asks Marco for his blessing, and then Marco thinks about it and says yes, and then they get married. Also, the way it was written made it seem like Marco gave him his blessing the day before the wedding. Also, Marco was able to invite all of his friends to this wedding. Yeah, including the one who gets... Like, essentially wasted and has to take a shit every two hours. <laughs> right? <laughs> Marco's friends are, like, part of... Like, his dad knows his friends, though. So, that's not that weird. But I do think it's weird. I mean, like you say, Brayden, didn't you say earlier that's what old people do? Is, like, yeah. you know, you've been married once, it's not the same. You, you've you been married once, it's like, hey, we're in love. Do you want to just get right to fucking this up? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Take it from a guy that's who's been wild. engaged. Yeah. Oh, it's, dark. Um, it happens so fast. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll find out also. Oh, there's also a super, super critical thing we didn't mention. The right. The very right. last paragraph of the book, Marco gets Oh, wait, 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 wait. Let's do a dramatic reading. <gasps> dramatic reading? I, I'm opening it now. I can do a one-man dramatic reading. Do it. No, no, no. Oh, God, no. I'm fucking going to be on this. Is okay, Marco. well, then I want I want to get my fingers in the pie. Okay, who's okay, Marco? Uh, can... Who's... The special guest. I'll no, do the Marco to be continued. Talk. I can be to be continued. I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. Your stage directions then, Tessa, and then uh, Brayden can be Visser. Does that work? Uh, she yeah. just says the one line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So wait, okay. so Brayden is the Visser. Yeah. I'm the stage directions. And, and I'm the narration. Are, and you're the narration. Okay. You mean Marco. You mean like the narrator. Marco. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do, do your best, Marco. I know. I'm trying to like draw on memory because we've definitely done his voice before <laughs> we've done his voice in like episode four for Five, book four and it was really racist <laughs> uh, no we decided he had a bronx accent that's right yeah. oh yeah that's right i Never decided mind. not to answer let the machine get it and then i heard a voice 
Marco, if you're there, pick up. My mother! To be continued in this, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So that's like the only that's the only two B continuum we've ever beautiful. seen except for the David trilogy. Yeah. Literally, that's it. I'm gonna read Vizard tonight. It's such a good book. And the craziest thing is I only read Vis this was one of the books that I owned. Like we owned book thirty five for whatever reason. And I didn't read Visser until I was like twenty. You dumb bitch. Right? <laughs> what the fuck? Why did I do that to myself? Uh. Also, it's such a good book. Yeah, I've heard it's quite good. I haven't read it before, but fuck. Like, Brayden, text me when you read it, because I want to hear your thoughts immediately. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, a lot of what I had to say about this book I've said already. Fucking mail merge. I don't know what that is. I like how they called back to the hotel from book 20. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We're, we're building out, you know, the locations in this book. They don't just go to the mall or to the garden. They also go to this fancy hotel. There is also a scene that I didn't mention that I kind of want to talk about, but it's um during the polar bear slash poodle morph that Marco fucks up near the end. Uh, Cassie is like, remember what I told you. Take care of your mental well-being. And Jake's like, no, fuck that. Do the <laughs> mission or we all die. Do the Get mission. Get your head out of your ass. Yeah. And Marco's like, oh. That's exactly what I needed, and it works. <laughs> and he, it's like, like fucking tough love, I guess, works on Marco. Yeah, Marco is like a super big tough yeah. love proponent. It's again back to that ideal gamer male. Like he doesn't need <laughs> some concerned woman to like tell him, "Look at your feeling." He needs a fellow active duty gamer to look him in the eye. Say a couple racial slurs and tell him, <laughs> suck it up. I feel like Axe definitely knows at this point that you're not supposed to just go ham wild on the food. And he's just doing it to prove that he's an alien in an uncertain land. Ooh, everything's new here. I don't understand your human culture. And it's like, Axe, you've been here for over a year. If you Stop. think that he, if you're really arguing that he's doing this is for some reason other than his own complete idiocy, then I take issue with that because, <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I think, like, at this point, like, even in the last book, or maybe it was this book, but they were like, yeah, we can't let Axe near food for real this time. I think it is in this book. Isn't I think it? it is in this book because Marco was supposed to be the one to take it out. Um. And then Marco had to deal with the pig bucket, so Axe was there, and yeah. Jake just, like, mm. sighs and is like, all right, Axe, I guess you gotta take us out. So <laughs> is Vizzer just gonna be, like, opening with, um, is it just gonna be, is it actually, like, just another Animorphs book and it's a fake out and it's just gonna be like, did your dad actually marry a white bitch? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Bye. <laughs> Okay, weird. This is a Cassie book now. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, it's just fake. It just ends. It's just like, so I saw Dad got remarried. Yeah, he thinks you're dead. Good. Bye. <laughs> so is that what you mean, Brayden? Because you said that there, uh, before you said there are some uncomfortable colonial metaphors. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, right, right. I put that in my notes. Okay. I actually took a picture of it. Let me pull it up quick. Sure. There is a metaphor that... um. That Marco uses when they're talking about, like, are you ready for this mission? And um, Marco says, am I ready? Was Sitting Bull ready for General Custer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Was General Schwartzkov ready for Saddam Hussein? Oof. Was General Washington ready for whoever's butt he kicked? Which, in that case, is a lot of Native Americans. I think he's referring to the Briton. The British, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's try. I know he's trying to, but we all know what that's about. Also, they fucking fought that war, didn't they? In Megamorph Three, yes, actually, I mean, they did. They were in like a fucked up version of it. It wasn't like the true version because at that point, the timeline was already fucked. They would have heard British voices being like, "Oi, blimey, man the cannons," or whatever they said. Well, it would have been like you know, it was a different timeline. 
One where America had slaves. Oh, right. True. <laughs> oh, God. That's getting into a whole can of worms here. Um, should we do an OTP alert? OTP alert! So there weren't really any good um, Rachel Co. moments. There was one where, like, sh- Rachel says something nice to Marco, and he's like, oh. Oh, that was nice. Oh, well, la dee da there, there is a bit near the beginning where uh, Marco makes a joke about Rachel and Tobias having, like, uh, watching Four City sex. together. And, um, and, he, and Rachel's like, yo, that's harsh. And Cassie, like, gives him a look like that was harsh. And Marco's like, oh, I feel bad. That maybe that was too harsh. I'll apologize to Tobias, but not to <laughs> Rachel. Gamer powers, baby! That's because he knows that Rachel actually wants Tobias to permamorph as a boy. Yeah, we learned that already from like, a lot of other parts. Yeah. Or at least that's something she's wrestling with. I don't know if she would really want him to do that because then he wouldn't be able to be involved in the war. And also, where would he live? But there's part of her that wishes that he could so that it would be easier. How do you guys feel about uh, Marco's dad and Nora? Is that an OTP? I mean, she teaches math. They have a really cute nerdy moment. In a later book, because Marco's dad, if we remember, is an engineer. Like fucking a relative's teacher? That's pretty hardcore. That's some Chad shit right there. (laughs) That's where Marco gets his gamer boy antics from. Yeah. His dad was one of the original gamers. I feel like it's like the, like if we're talking, because OTP stands for one true pairing, right? Yeah. That's gotta be Marco's dad and Marco's mom. So this is this can't be an OTP. I mean, well, he still loves her. Like OTPs, OTPs don't have to. I, I don't know if this is true. OTPs don't have to end up canon. An OTP is a personal preference. Like a lot of people's OTPs in Kingdom Hearts are Sora and that gray-haired dude that he barely talks to through the entirety of the second Riku. Riku. Of the second game. It's like, Wait, that's yeah, but OTP? they talk about each other. They want... It's like, you, it's an OTP is a personal preference. You would like to see them uh, fuck. Like, or Mikhail, your OTP in a relationship. is Rachel Co. Mm-hmm. That's not canon, uh, okay. but it's your OTP. Yeah. In that sense, it makes sense, but I think it's not my OTP, because I would prefer Marco's dad to be with his mom, because she's a badass. Okay. I mean, OT, OTP alert at this point, it, because it's kind of like... It's not just for us. No, and I know some <laughs> yeah. people in the fandom do really like Nora. Like, she seems like a nice person. And she makes the dad happy. Like, they get along. Yeah. Although you do have... We do have to acknowledge it is mad disrespect to Marco's mom downgrading to a white girl. I don't know how to feel about that statement. We have not had a good... Visser 3 Morph Minute in a very long time. Yeah, he's just like a disappointed voice. I'm yeah. trying to think back on literally the last time he morphed something crazy. 31. I What did he morph in 31? Uh, the weird camouflage chameleon that climbed up the uh, mountain. Remember? That was 30, not 31. That was 30. That was Marco's last book. That was five books ago. Yeah, all the good shit happens in Marco's book. I've been telling you guys this for years. <laughs> the next Marco <laughs> book is very good as well. I'm very excited. <laughs> next week, in our bi-weekly episode of The Speaking Tree, we'll be talking about how we maybe could have made the banquet actually work, or at the very least, go better than it did. And by work, we mean make the banquet work for the Animorphs. We don't mean just take over the banquet. Yeah, we become... <laughs> If I were Marcel, here's how I would do the banquet. (laughs) Next week, we are not Animorphs. We are Anna Marcel's. Oh, nice. (laughs) Good. Uh, We'll also be talking about how we would use morphing to deal with our parent dating someone new a few years after their partner died. And, like, actually died. Not, like, is secretly a yerk or something. As well as, how would we use a poodle morph for purely personal reasons? Tessa, where can people find more of our stuff? You can find more of our stuff on our podcast page at collectivelegacy.org or on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, or Facebook. Remember to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, or else I'm going to downgrade to a white bitch. Mmm.
Oh, <laughs> you can show your support oh. for our show at our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash D-O-R-K-B-A-J-I-R. We offer special bonuses for patrons like access to our Discord server, Animorphs essays written by us, and much, much more. We like to give a shout out to our patrons at the hork level or higher by giving them an Animorph style title. Big shout out to Anne-Marie Ellis, colon... Marcel. Anyanka colon ZP Andrew Vila colon the Puig Bucket. That's a deep cut baseball reference for y'all out there. Michael Armenta colon the math teacher. Zachary Vaudo colon Euclid's Little Nails tip tapping along Marco's bedroom floor. Ace Chavez colon the treasure. Mariah Wamby, colon, the Pooh Bear. Nick, colon, them sweaty gorilla arms on my tuna fish sandwich. Greg Delaposta, colon, them dry lobster arms on my skinny bird bones. Shanna, colon, Zach Hansen. Steam driven, colon, the steam driving the janky engine of William Roger Tennant's whole ethos. Martha Urquhart, colon, what? Elemis, colon, that's fucking Swiss Army Knife, baby! Yeah! Oh, Swiss Army! Army. Oh, For the oh, fan oh, worse, my name is Mikhail, the host. I'm Tessa, the expert. And I'm Brayden, the And this has been Phanomorphs, The Math Bajir Chronicles. I don't think we, you know, we didn't really talk enough about um, how cool, like, animal hybrid morphs can be right in here. Oh, we did talk about hybrid morphs in the last book. Because oh, did Rikassi we? morphed like a whale, but from a bird, and was like half oh, yeah. bird, half whale. Well, she was, she, I think it went like a, like a striped Neapolitan ice cream sandwich where she was bird human whale okay (laughs) sure that's still pretty cool i think what do you want to eat eat right right now now? jinx Jinx. i'm mitch and i'm sophie and this is we We Watch watch Food. food A podcast all about the food we like to watch. We'll talk all about the best, the craziest, and the tastiest TV, movies, and YouTube channels. Not to mention trendy food fads and sumptuous food trivia. Plus, we end every episode with a recipe from one of us. So join us every Saturday for a new episode and a new insight into what makes us watch so much food. You can find us at collectivelegacy.org, as well as a bunch of other awesome podcasts. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at We Watch Food. And on Twitter at We Watch Food Pod. So I've been Mitch. I'm Sophie. Bye-bye. Bye. Brought to you by Collective Legacy, a podcast network.